We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay away! So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Bad Timing on October 25th, 1980. It was written by Yale Udoff, directed by Nicholas Rogue, and released by Rank Film Distributors. Rank Films? Rank Film Distributors. Like R-A-N-K? Mm-hmm. Mm. That seems like a first for this year. Yeah, I think so. Producer-director Roger Corman was briefly attached to this film. The working title was Illusions, but it couldn't raise the necessary funds. I- illusions or Illusions? Illusions. Okay. This does not feel Roger Corman-y at all. No. And that title makes less sense than Bad Timing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By mid-1977, the script was no longer considered viable, but producer Jeremy Thomas, the 28-year-old son of British director Ralph Thomas, read the script and wanted to work with Rogue to promote his career. When Rogue agreed to direct, Thomas negotiated a $4 million deal with Rank Film Distributors. The title was changed after a lawsuit from author Richard Bach, who argued that the title represented unfair competition to the future motion picture rights of his novel, Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. (laughs) I don't think anyone was going to confuse these two. Well, also, if you don't already have a movie out under that name, I don't think you have any right to make a claim to that. Well, the book was already out with that name, and he didn't want people to think that this movie was related to his book, I guess. Okay. The new title was announced as Bad Timing, A Sensual Obsession, and rated X by the MPAA, an appeal was denied, and they submitted a recut to get it down to an R. Was the cut we watched the R or the X? It was the R. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yep. That's a they hard left, R. They left a lot in for an R. Yeah. <laughs> Sissy Spacek was the first choice to play Milena. The finished film took the top honor at the 1980 Toronto Film Festival. Sissy Spacek? It's a very weird choice. That is so weird. Like, this person needed to be... Like, she's too cute and wholesome. Like, yeah. this mm-hmm. person needed to be, like, a total sex pot. Especially with the other characters we've seen Sissy play this year. Yeah. It really doesn't fit in her whole genre. No. Unless she was trying to break yeah. some kind of genre for herself. I also can't imagine her doing all these sex scenes, though. No, maybe not. Director Nicholas Rogue and actress Teresa Russell, 30 years his junior, fell in love on the set and were married soon after. She would appear in six more of Rogue's films throughout the 80s. Director Christopher Nolan counts this film among his 10 favorites in the Criterion catalog. Huh. Okay. I can see where he takes influence in some of the ways he cuts things. Sure. Yeah. I think there's a lot of inception in this movie. Yeah. We open on art observing art on a wall. (laughs) That's Art Garfunkel, the (laughs) actor, playing Alex Linden in the film. And then we match cut to a woman looking at the same art. Tom Waits sings Invitation to the Blues over the scene. We are in the gallery of a collage artist with an affinity for gold leaf. Suddenly, the music is drowned out by the sirens of an ambulance speeding through the night. Did you just throw, like, famous art to the side by saying he's just got an affinity for gold leaf? This is Klimt. I couldn't Google the adjectives. To okay. Figure out who well, it was. The, the painting is called "The Kiss," okay, and it is by Klimt. He's a fam- very, very famous Colossist Austrian artist with an affinity for gold leaf, right? All right, sure. He is. <laughs> a woman is getting oxygen from an EMT while Alex watches over her. We cut from here to a rainy border checkpoint where Denim Elliott as Stefan Vognik, at least according to IMDb, his name is Vognik, but later we'll see that it's Vodnik, and everyone calls him Vodnik. But uh, his credentials are being checked against a list. We hear Paco Bell Cannon and D here, which we got an earful of in Ordinary People earlier this year. Stefan's credentials are approved, and he pulls across a bridge out of Bratislava. They pull over on the bridge, and he takes out a case from his trunk and stops to look at what I think is a small decorative lamp in the trunk. But who knows? We never come back to this. Nope. I thought it was a bomb. 
I, I, at this point, I was convinced this is some kind of espionage thriller. Yes. <laughs> I, I, it kind of is? Yeah, it kind of is. Yeah, I wish but, it was more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it was like, okay, so there's this girl, and now, now we're clearly in a flashback because here's the girl all, alive. And but not, whenever it's a spy thing, you have to pay attention to every tiny detail. Yeah, exactly. So I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be the thing. Noted. Stefan smokes a cigarette and pulls a ring off the finger of his female companion, but she pulls it right back from him. Uh, he asks if she'll call, but it seems like she probably won't. She drives the car away as Stefan walks back across the bridge in the direction they came from. Alex's girlfriend is rolled into a hospital and the staff keep him out of the emergency room. We see a quick montage of her ingesting drugs and alcohol in an apartment and mumbling to him over the phone. It sounds like she called to say goodbye and he answered her cry for help to get her to a hospital. Her apartment is a mess and his is very neat and tidy, populated with electronic recording equipment and a typewriter and hundreds of books. It's a giant recorder too. Yeah. That only holds one three minute tape and <laughs> one 25 minute tape. It's like, why is this machine so big? Yeah. Well, that's how that's how uh, voicemail used to work though because you'd have one tape that held the your, message. your outgoing message, yeah. and then the longer tape would hold the incoming message. Right, but, it, but it's taking up the whole desk. Of it yeah, yes, it is massive. At the hospital, a doctor asks what she took, and he presents them with a bottle. Was it full before? I wouldn't know, doctor. The doctor tells Alex that his cigarettes will kill him. We get a quick flash of the girl from the bridge, and now she's drinking, smoking, and laughing with a mustachioed man at a party somewhere. It looks like this is the night that she and Alex met. Teresa Russell is this girl. Her name is Malena Flaherty in the movie. And it's the same girl from the bridge. So the ambulance girl and the bridge girl are all the same person. This movie jumps around. This movie was really hard to take notes on. Yes. Because I don't know when things are happening. Yes. And whose flashback it is because sometimes it's his and sometimes it's hers from the hospital. Yeah. And Hmm. so I was like, I don't know when this is occurring until it starts to get close. Or if it's occurring. That's the other thing that they probably do. Um, and cause I guess it kind of has like a little bit of a Dunkirk esque kind of thing where as we go through the movie, the flashbacks are getting closer to right. this Present. moment, yes. yeah. Yeah. which makes, which makes sense, but it takes you a good three quarters of the movie to figure that out, yeah. which is difficult. She finds Alex in a tux at the party and begins to introduce herself. Alex suggests not sharing their names because there will always be the chance that they could have been perfect together. Back in the hospital, he's smoking again in the hall when a doctor again asks him in German to put out the cigarette. He notices a leaking steam pipe, and we cut back to the party. Milena finds Alex in a hallway and blocks a door frame with her leg up high, letting her skirt right up her leg a bit. She slips him a matchbox with her number, but refuses to put her leg down, so he opts to duck under it to get out of the party. The hospital staff, in the present, I believe, Ask him again if he is a husband or a relative. You could say I'm a friend. Alex says that she called him to bring her here. They want to know if she overdosed before or after the call. How would I know? She called and said I'll be dead in a minute. I wanted to say goodbye. We cut back to his apartment when she called, and he must have picked up while she was leaving a message because now it's on his answering machine tape. The investigators want to know when she called him and how she sounded on the phone, but his recollections aren't much use. This really bothered me throughout because this this point is belabored yes. throughout the the film, mm-hmm. and I was really confused by it frequently because he clearly can he clearly is recalling seeing clocks and watches when when he's flashing yeah. back, so he's obviously lying. Yeah, and there's evidence that he could go back and see the tape, but it it. The way he always delivers it, because we keep flashing back and forth, like, I'm not super clear that he's lying until the end. Yeah, I think he's trying to come off as, like, either a boyfriend that has given up completely on this person or as a very blasé friend for them to think that he's literally just somebody who doesn't care and brought her here because that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And see, and I wasn't sure of the relationship at this point at all in that I thought maybe he was, he, she was, again, espionage stuff in my mind. Is like is he using her as an a- she an asset, and he's like her her, her handler, or is he and, avenging a honeypot? It, what, what's like, going on? Yeah, like is that why he seems so so detached from her? Like I don't care what happens to her, kind yeah. of like because she I was just using her anyway for information. 
We see Alex and Milena on a date, and she asks to see his favorite place in Vienna. We cut back to the hospital where she's struggling for breath. Doctors tell Alex that the medications she took together form a very toxic mix. In a flashback, Alex hands Milena a stack of playing cards with colors on them. She spreads them across the hood of a car and puts them in the order that makes sense to her, and then he flips them over to reveal numbers, and then checks those numbers against a code book to tell her information about herself, I guess. It's like a personality test. But uh, he tells her that he doesn't think she should be alone, and she laughs it off. Um, this is... They, like, she's weirdly excited about going to the store for this book. This isn't, like, a book that he published, is it? Because he's, like, a psychologist no. or a psychiatrist or yeah, something. He is a psychiatrist, but I don't think that he had anything to do with the creation of this book. Because I think he would know more about what the numbers would mean then. Yeah. Probably. Or he just read it instantly on the back of this car. He's like, <laughs> oh, this lady's bad news. <laughs> or he just knew that already about her. At home later, he reads her poetry, and she seems to enjoy it. It's his own poetry. She stands to go to the bathroom and invites him to follow because she has something that she would like to try, presumably a drug of some sort. We cut back to the art gallery from the beginning. She's there with him this time, and they're arguing over whether the subjects of the art appear happy together. Alex thinks they do. Later in a car, she tells him about her history of abortions. She's had two, and then she spills a drink in her lap and complains that it's burning her crotch. So he offers to pull over at a cafe to get her something to solve the problem. Um, oh, I thought I thought I, the implication yeah. was that they would pull over and he would solve the problem for her manually. Right. <laughs> but he says, well, maybe we could stop at a cafe and I could help you. <laughs> but on their way into the cafe, Milena just makes out with a random guy. Uh, Alex is understandably jealous. And she says that they're old friends. To cheer him up, she straddles him at the bar. And we cut to them about to have sex at home and then back to the hospital where she's dying again. We're going to do a lot of this juggling of scenes. Yeah, I don't remember which one it was, but several of them are incredibly disturbing because we're we're cutting back and forth to her like essentially coding yeah. at the same time that, that they're she's, having sex, and yeah. so so all of the the cuts and the sort of you know imagery of the motions like they they match up between the scenes, yeah. which I think is brilliant cutting and it, and it's it, but it's super disturbing yeah it's very depressing to see the o face and the od face <laughs> back and forth <laughs> sometime later alex is speaking with students or other professors maybe somewhere when he receives word that a young lady is here to see him he moves to his office where he finds Milena waiting for him and they begin to kiss on his couch we go back to the hospital where she's choking again in another flashback, he is arriving home to find her drunk and confused at the kitchen table. He doesn't seem interested in talking to her here. We cut back again to the hospital, and Inspector Natusil, or Netasil? How would you pronounce this? It, it sounds like a cough medicine. Yeah. Inspector Netasil, played by Harvey Keitel, audible this time. Yay, we get to hear his voice. Yeah. Also, his voice is totally fine. I don't know why we skipped it in Saturn 3. It just didn't sound futuristic enough, I guess. But he enters the room and he starts asking a lot of the same questions that Alex has already answered for the inspector at the hospital. How does she sound? Did it sound like she was joking? Did she seem excited? Alex is tired of answering and permits Netasil to put down whatever he wants in the paperwork. But he says, no, I need an answer from you. When Alex admits to the inspector that he is a professor of psychiatry, he asks if this girlfriend is a bit mad. Alex says that's not a word he would ever use, which is similar to dress to kill when he said, oh no, we don't, we don't use that word. To describe people alex lectures a class on spies and spying like i don't know if this is because of his experiences with melena but here he is in front of the classroom talking about what spies are and what spying is by definition well it seems as though he has experience assisting with um investigations of that so. nature yeah a student asks based on his examples of a child and her parent or the heads of intelligence agencies if he himself or she the student couldn't be classified as spies and he says they could though he prefers the word observer we see alex and melena speaking in a car again it seems like this is a reunion after a break between them he asks if she's still seeing that actor and she avoids confirming that she is she asks if he's here to apologize and that she doesn't want to argue with him again he immediately leaps into, oh, you have to move in with me. It's going to be great. And <laughs> she's like, all right, well, bye. And she just gets out of the car and walks away. We see Alex decorating his home office for a moment. He hangs this weird 
maze and ball illustration on the wall before we cut to Inspector Netisil at his home with his wife and child taking the same framed illustration off the wall and sliding it into a cabinet. And we zoom into his Harvard diploma on the wall before cutting back to Alex. This threw me off for a long time. I, I, yeah. I, I was like, did he steal that from his apartment? Was he? W- Are they like, just very similar people? Yeah. Do they have very similar tastes in art, or is this does is this way later and he moves into his apartment? Yeah. <laughs> I don't understand what's happening. I, we never figure this out. Though. No, yeah. they never explain it. Alex picks up a phone and almost dials, stops, and then picks it up again. And we see Milena answer a phone and say hello a couple times to no apparent response. And then we cut to a club where a performance has just ended, and the audience applauds. The crowd chats among themselves. And Alex notices Milena with a man, possibly that actor guy, and ducks back behind a wall to avoid being caught by her. But I think she sees him. A topless dancer takes the stage in the club and starts climbing on some netting over the audience. (laughs) It's the weirdest performance. It's it's fascinating, though. She's like doing her well i guess she's not strip teasing because she's already already naked. topless when she it comes just, out and, yeah. and but she's bouncing on top of the netting uh and like, like hanging right like above it's, people yeah like it's like it's a trampoline above people but you could see right through it so i guess that's appealing yeah <laughs> i guess Milena moves away to find alex she surprises him with a kiss and invites him to join them on the rest of their date and he says i'm gonna be with you They leave together. Back in the hospital, the inspectors are asking Alex to sign the statement he's given them. He seems hesitant, but they assure him it's a formality. Alex asks if he can run out for some cigarettes, and Netisil informs him that he is free to go anywhere. I don't know if it's just the transfer, but it feels on purpose here that everything is tinted blue during this taking of the statement, and then there's this jarring white balance Yeah. while Netisil waits for Alex's answer to, are you coming back? I think this is a transfer. Yeah, okay. I, I think it was. Some it just kind seemed of... intentional with how blatant it was. Um, but he does say, I'll be back. I'm not leaving. I'm just going to go get cigarettes and come back. Alex stands on a bridge smoking, looking into the river, and we crossfade to Milena's inviting arms, and then them having sex, and then back to her choking. They are performing an emergency tracheotomy, and then Alex and Milena are having sex again. Was this someone's real tracheotomy operation? It looked real real. It looked really real. Uh, I don't know. We saw surgery earlier this year in uh, the first Deadly Sin, so it could be stock footage, but I think it was just effects here. Really fancily, fancily shot? Yeah. F- fancily shot I like stock fancily. footage. <laughs> the doctors get Milena intubated, and we cut back to Alex and Milena in bed talking about her father. She moved around a lot as a kid, wherever her father was stationed. Her mother was already out of the picture, and her brother also passed away very young in an auto accident. Alex asks her if she's ever been married, and she says no, but changes the subject very quickly. We see Vodnik working at a desk in another flashback, and Milena enters the home office in a bathrobe with wet hair. He takes her hand, and she gives him a kiss, and then we cut to them making love. So this is a flashback in a flashback, which I... Hate. So we flash back from the <laughs> hospital in in Alex's perspective to this conversation that he had with her, and then suddenly from the flashback, we're flashing back in her perspective yeah, to is, her previous marriage that she which is even about. more frustrating that he's flashing back on events that he couldn't possibly know about. Right. right. Suddenly, Alex is on the same bridge inspecting it. We cut back to Vodnik's place where Milena seems to be moving out. She drops a key on the nightstand beside him and collects a briefcase to exit smiling directly into camera which which is odd because i thought that That they had broken up earlier in the film yeah or that their breakup would have gone differently yeah because but as we i guess as we come to know uh melina she constantly is making up breaking up yeah with, with the guys so this could have been an off again on again off again thing Back on the bridge, Alex watches Milena step out of another man's car, and she walks the length of the bridge to Alex. He's pretty pissed off at her because evidently she was supposed to be here yesterday, but she thinks he's overreacting because they're moving in with each other and he should be happy. At the end of this fight, though, she turns to walk back across the bridge away from him because he cannot forgive her for being so late. I think this was the point, because I feel like I'm 
like made a transition through this film about how I felt about these characters. And I think this was the point where I was totally not on his side anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was really mad at him for the whole rest of the film. And c- yeah, cause he just wants what he wants without any regard to her. Yeah. And even if someone gives him what he wants, if they don't give it to him in the right way, right. Then he's very picky. About I, it. I, I don't know if it was, a, if it was earlier or if it's going to happen later, there's a scene where where he comes over to her apartment, and when she says, "I don't, I just don't want her right now," and so he says, "Well, I have to go." Yeah, yeah. and I don't know if that is that later it's or later. It's later. Okay, yeah. yeah. I was just like, but Dude, I, you I are mean, an asshole. From yep. this point on, I think he just gets sort of worse and worse, worse and worse yeah. and worse. So like he degrades throughout the film in terms of how he is. But uh, you know, I realized. At this, at this was the very juncture at which I'm like, oh, We're not supposed to sympathize he's the with bad him. guy. Yeah, yeah. She's she's obviously not all you know sunshine and roses, but he's the bad guy in yeah. this film. <laughs> we see her in the hospital again, and Alex is getting home to his office. He listens to some of his messages. The first one is his boss asking when he'll be returning to New York. The second is a girl named Amy asking him to call because. He doesn't have any sort of monogamy on his side of this relationship with her. But he's so obsessively jealous of her all yep. the time. Like, you know, kissing the guy, going to the cafe, and like many times in the future here, he just gets so obsessed, but doesn't seem to have the same standards for himself. Right. We see Alex in some sort of military facility where a man he seems to be friends with offers to take some files out of a classified vault for him to peruse for an article. I don't know if this is actually for an article, but he tells him it's for an article. Oh, I thought he was... No, he's helping him. It's not for an article. I thought he said the word article when they first walk into the room. No, because the guy said, hey, like they're they're bringing him in as a freelancer, essentially, because he said, our normal guy is so busy, we're just slammed right now. So they're bringing him in to to, uh, to write a profile on these two people. Maybe I read her profile and thought like an article, like a profile. Oh, no, like a profile, like... Intelligence profile. Yeah, exactly. The first file he opens is Vodnik's, and inside he finds a picture of his girlfriend, Vodnik's wife. Alex speaks with another contact on Vodnik, who rather flippantly confirms that the spy and his girlfriend were married. We get a shot of Melina eating in bed, and we see Alex inspecting a painting of a unicorn. He lays down on the bed with her, and she shares her yogurt against his will. He asks her why she lied about ever having been married, and she says that she didn't want to upset him, and she didn't think it was important. And he says, unimportant to whom? And then we're getting flashes of her in the hospital and getting hit with a defibrillator on the operating table, and then we're suddenly back in the bed again, and we see Alex is now shouting at Melina and choking her hard in the bed. Not important to whom? David. To whom? To whom? (laughs) To whom? (laughs) To whom? But then suddenly, important to whom? that scene wasn't even really happening. That was yeah. just a fantasy moment of his. I Yeah, that's it's really confusing that we're going to a flashback that becomes a fantasy and then goes back to flashback and then goes back to present time. Yeah, mm-hmm. it seems unfair to the viewer to change what's going on in the present so often Yeah, that you can't keep track of these things. But... He wasn't actually choking her. He just really wanted to in that moment, I guess. Here's where I, I put, I'm officially getting bored with this movie. <laughs> this is, it's like, okay, the only thing that was slightly interesting happened now 45 minutes in, and then they took it away from us. Inspector Nedicel stands in an office and picks up a box of Marlboros to sniff them for some reason, and then we cut back to Malena in an apartment. She admits that she loved her first husband, and Alex points out a nearly 30-year age difference. We cut to Milena arriving home another day, and when... It's funny, because she was 30 years different from the director of this film, who she ended up with. We cut to Milena arriving home another day, and when she moves into Alex's office to kiss him, he sets aside the orange folder with all of Vodnik's information. She notices him doing this with a side glance and must recognize the significance of the orange folder. Yeah, now I'm back on the espionage right? plot. Right. <laughs> yes? I'm like, ooh, she is a spy. I wanted so much more of this plot line, and it's just never satisfying. She asks him to take her out somewhere exciting, 
and we zoom into the page sticking out of his typewriter, he seems to be transcribing Vodnik's file. I say Vodnik instead of Vognik because this is where I learned that it was Vodnik and not Vognik as IMDb suggests. <laughs> so I'm just going to switch to Vodnik now because it's easier to say and probably right. According to his file, Vodnik was born in Prague in 29. He's a captain in the Czech Air Force, a resident of Paris. He's worked in the past as a trade representative with junior diplomatic status, but he is presently the international sales director of the Skida Motor Corporation. We cut from the page to Vodnik in bed with a different woman, cupping her breasts while she smokes topless. I don't know who this woman is or why we needed this shot. We zoom out of one of the art pieces from the exhibit that kicked off the film to see that Alex and Malena are in bed together under it, so I guess they bought a print of this one. A book of art is open face on the bed beside them, and as she talks about past lovers, Malena stands to make them a cheese omelet when Alex starts flipping through the art book and finds photographs of Vodnik and also of Malena and another younger man in an embrace. Somehow we cut right to Alex on a bus with the pictures, sitting a few seats away from a man, and he's trying to figure out if this is the guy from the pictures or not. Yeah. I don't think it is, though. No, it, no it's, it's not. not. It, it's just another example of him being obsessively possessive of her and and just you know now projecting that every man is in a relationship with her but do you think that he's been following this guy for a while and checking him against the photo or do no. you think he's just noticed him on the bus i think and was he's like, just noticed him on the, the bus and he's a crazy crazy man who yeah. can't let anybody else be around this girl we get a little snippet from the who's who are you but no lyrics alex notices another man on the bus watching him we cut back to the hospital where Alex is being woken from a nap, but they don't really tell him anything. They just kind of wake him up and then they walk out of the room. We cut back to the hospital where Melena is getting injections. Oh, we also see, I think here is where a doctor is using a speculum on her all of a sudden. I was very yes. confused about what's going on. Oh, yeah, no. At that's this a, moment it, in the scene. I, I wasn't confused at all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, nope, they're doing a rape kit. <laughs> yeah, but I was just like... How much is wrong with her? Like, is there something that's literally causing problems all over the body? Or nope. The police all leave in a car, and we cut to a fancy car pulling through a gate into a building. Alex asks a woman for information on divorce in this country. I, and- I, I just want to point out that I didn't know exactly what was going on because I've experienced this before. Yeah. I'm just, I no. understand You're very careful with your problems. drugs. <laughs> Med- medical procedures. Yeah. You are familiar. Yes. <laughs> I've never done this to an unconscious woman. That's no, what no. I'm saying. I, I meant I've not. No, I get it. I get it. Okay. okay. <laughs> but they didn't have, they didn't have that technology to do DNA. No. For that at this not point. In the, not at this point in the 80s. No, I don't think so. And certainly not in. But I think they even make Eastern that point block. later. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, he does make that point that that there isn't really anything that they can prove from it. But other I think than that, there was a that, sample found. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Alex asks a woman for information on divorce in this country. She directs him to an office upstairs. He sits down with an attorney and asks how divorce works here. The man tells him that step one is asking for one, but Alex insists he's asking for a friend. It just seems like a guy who wants a divorce is really nervous about asking for one, but really he's not married to her and he wants to know if she's divorced from her husband or not. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand the whole point of this. Well, I thought he was doing the legwork to be like, look, I know what it takes to get a divorce. You just have to sign right here and you're good to go. Yeah. Melena doesn't understand why it should matter so much to him. And he complains that she is sloppy. And as a result, both of their places are a constant mess. The police pull up behind an orange car at the curb and identify it as his, meaning Alex's. This is, we learn later, this is the night after the incident where she OD'd or maybe no, late it's the, that night. It's the same night. Yeah. Night of, yeah. yeah. Inside the car, Nettisil makes a determination somehow that the car has been parked for 14 minutes. Inside the building, they move through an unlocked door, and we cut to Alex arriving home to a cleaned-up apartment, courtesy of Milena. Uh, We should also point out uh, that Nettisil realized that the radio was on. Right. But it was on a station that was no longer broadcasting. And he asks one of his other men, oh, what time does that station stop broadcasting? And he said, oh, it only runs until midnight. And then the, the other station comes on. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, is that what you do all night? And he's like, no, no, no. I don't listen to the radio all night. I, I do my <laughs> job. He's like, okay. I don't think that 14-minute thing was accurate. I think that note is wrong. I don't know. Because uh, the he, car had been there for a couple hours. You know, he, he said that it, it took, it, 
the 14 minutes was how long it took them to get from the hospital to this location or he was measuring the distance at the time it took to drive from one place to another. And I oh, think so, oh. so from her house in the ambulance that to the hospital? That makes more sense, yeah. yes. But they'd be going a lot faster in the ambulance to the hospital than they would. No, because the they, they had just the driven car. back to her place from the hospital. Right. But they and, didn't and have they sirens clock, on the whole and time. And they timed it. Right. But the point was, I think they actually probably went from his house to her oh, house. Oh, okay. They wanted to time how long it would take for him to get there. Right. Inside the building, they move through an unlocked door, and we cut to Alex arriving home to a cleaned-up apartment courtesy of Milena. We see Netasil watching from the door frame in the other timeline. So we're watching the same room in two different times. Right. We're watching it the night of the OD and then yeah. several hours later. Yeah. Or and there's days some pretty later. cool camera work happening in here. I think, like, the, like the, the transition from a dirty to clean room yeah. was, was great because they really did just you know lock that camera down and, and yeah. transition it was it was flawless so uh alex tries to lead melina to bed and she isn't interested so he straight up grandpa simpson's out of there <laughs> that's this is the moment when he's like yeah. oh well you're not interested okay well, well then i don't have you. time for this bye uh she tries to stop him and explains that she does things when she wants to and he agrees angrily he's like yeah you do you only do things when you want to why don't you ever do things when you don't want to <laughs> Uh, she starts stripping on the stairs where the neighbors might see, and they just have sex on the stairs as Netasil watches from the other timeline. So he's just guessing what happened here. Milena starts shouting for him to love her, and then she runs inside and trashes the apartment. I wouldn't be surprised if this old Harvey Keitel alternate time frame thing was a big inspiration for the Willem Dafoe character in Troy Duffy's Boondock Saints. Oh, yeah? Because he's, like, walking through a crime scene and, like, reenacting it, and mm -hmm. they're editing the actual crime taking place back and forth with mm. him doing the, like, pantomiming the shooting. Keitel and his men move into the messy apartment to investigate. He opens a geode and dumps a handful of sand out of it as we fade to a desert road. Alex and Milena are waiting for a ride in a broken-down car. They flag down a passing vehicle, and Alex speaks to the driver in French for a moment before Milena starts waving her boobs at them, and she's invited in for a ride. She rides in the cab, and Alex is in the bed with a pack of goats. He takes them to a hotel in, I think, Casablanca? I, maybe we should clarify. He's in the bed of the truck with a pack of goats. <laughs> yeah. No, he's in the bed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm assuming that they're in Morocco. Yeah. yeah. Uh, with the with the French. Yeah, but it looks very Casablanca-y, and they check in. Uh, we fade from night to morning on Alex and Melina in bed. It's a then, really cool transition, yes, too. Yes, yeah. Like, uh, the, the whole way that I, – I wasn't sure what was happening when I was watching it. Like, I was like, is mm -hmm. there just a bright light coming in? No. I was like, oh, no, no, they're actually transitioning to day. This, yeah. Is, yeah. this is beautiful. This is yeah. early for this kind of an effect. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. once again, they did the locked off camera and had the, the lighting transition. But the lighting is very convincing, like mm -hmm. daylighting, daylight yeah. coming through the window and the sun rising. And then we cut to Keitel exploring the apartment more. He finds some photos of Milena's exes, the, uh, the husband and the quote unquote boyfriend, he holds up a note that reads, I wish you'd understand me less and loved me more. I wish you could stop defining. On a rooftop cafe that reminded me a lot of one in Raiders, Alex presents Milena with plane tickets to New York. But these tickets, the reason I think they're in Casablanca is because that was the starting point mm. um, on the ticket, but that could mean that Casablanca is the closest airport. He tells her that he wants to go back to New York and get married, and she asks him what he thinks about this place. He's upset that she isn't shocked by his proposal, but it seems like she's just not ready to make this commitment I, to him. Well, I, but actually, I thought she said, what What about this place? And I thought she meant, let's get married right here, right now. That's what I thought yeah, she meant me at first. Too. But as the conversation goes on, it's clear that's not what she meant. I don't, I don't know. I'm not totally convinced because I feel like we've established before that she offers him what he wants. And it's just not the way he wants it. And so he rejects it. Yeah. But when I rewatch the scene, it's not like she's saying, yes, let's do it. Or why don't we just get married here? She just says, but what about this place? It's so great. Like she's changing the subject. Yeah, like okay. she she's not interested in it. And uh, she points again to the atmosphere around them and wants them to appreciate what they already have. And then we cut to them on a plane. And they're headed to New York now. And she's holding the geode in her seat in the, in the plane. Melina is tidying up Alex's office when she finds the government file on herself and she feels betrayed. She leaves her keys on Alex's desk and walks out. 
we push into the back cover of the book that came with the deck of cards for the color test that he had her take earlier, and it reads, The Lucher Color Test, despite the ease and speed with which it can be administered, is a deep psychological test developed for the use of psychiatrists, psychologists, physicians, and those who are professionally involved with the conscious and unconscious characteristics and motivations of others. It is not a parlor game, and most emphatically, it is not a weapon to be used in a general contest of one-upsmanship. We cut to the couple having sex again, and then back to Melina and surgery. Alex at his apartment gets a call from Bratislava and agrees to take it. He has Vodnik on the phone. He tells Vodnik that Melina is missing and has been for a while and asks for any hints to where she might be. Vodnik points out that it's in his best interest if Alex finds her right away because she'll tire of him sooner and then he can have her back. Vodnik hangs up. Kaitel asks Alex if Vodnik is her husband and he says yes. He also asks if this is the first attempt that she's made on her life and he says that she's made statements in the past but never followed through. But he checked on her just to be certain expecting her to be fine we cut to alex in a cafe with other professors there's literally a poster of alex's face on the wall in the cafe so it must be a very sophisticated place to be decorated with psychiatrists mm -hmm. on campus he notices melena talking to yet another man and moves to speak with her when he leaves but this is clearly like some time later yes like she's walked out on him and now it's been quite some time a long break but we get a weird bit of telepathy here. Before he speaks out loud, we hear Alex's voice say, Lost your tan. And then he goes up and says, Lost your tan, huh? More than a month, it fades. And then she does something similar a couple times in this conversation, but that we hear, we're hearing their voices without their lips moving, and then their lips move and say the thing that we just heard them think. I, yeah, I was going to say, that's their inner thought, right? But this is the only scene where they do it that at all. It is the only scene that they... It's, I was confused at first, and then I was annoyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. At first, I was like, oh, God, did this just fall way out of sync? And I'm like, oh, no, it didn't. They're and, just... and if you're going to do that, if you're going to have, like, the, the inner thought needs to be different. Ne yeah. It needs shouldn't... to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be exactly it what you're about to say. It can't be say. a Willie and Phil thing. She is apologizing for not answering his calls, but admits that she is here on campus specifically to chance meeting him. Well, he, she says, well, you could have called me. It's like, I called you five or ten times. She goes, oh, well. Sorry. <laughs> she doesn't have one of them giant machines on her desk. That's to right. Messages. She doesn't have room. He asks her if the man that she was just with is the younger one from her photos, and then she realizes that he's the one who took those photos. She's especially hurt because the man that he was so jealous of from the photo is actually her brother, her late brother who died young, and those were likely the only pictures she had of him. He doesn't believe her, and she leaves because there's no use in arguing with this man. Later, we see her coming home drunk in the morning when Alex approaches and complains that he's been waiting in the car all night. She just wants to go to bed and asks him repeatedly what he wants. What do you want to do? Go up and make love? Go up and fuck? And we already know that's all he wants. He's made it very clear in the stairwell earlier uh, that that was literally all he wanted from her. She asks how she can convince him that she loves him. Would suicide do it? She admits that yes, she slept with that guy from the campus last night, and he chases her up the stairs to slap her because he's an idiot. Back in the hospital, Kaitel asks if Alex got her the prescriptions that she OD'd on, and he reminds him, I'm not her doctor. I'm a friend, that's it. Of course. Did you get her the prescription? I'm a friend, that's it. Of course, you did tell us that. Right. Did you get her the prescriptions that she OD'd? <laughs> Answer the question. Kaitel asks what Alex believes could have driven her to this action, and we cut to him in bed with another woman when his phone rings. It's Malena, and she quickly realizes that someone is there, but he lies that he's alone. When she gets upset, he tells her, Listen, it's a little late for drunken phone calls. Huh? Oh, Christ, the usual lecture. Jesus, Alex. Malena, your scenes are boring, dull, and stupid. Here, Malena admits that she's seen the Orange Files, and he knows full well that she isn't stupid. She hangs up on him, and the woman he's with asks, She wouldn't do anything stupid. I don't know. He leaves to go check on her at the apartment, and when he gets there, her face is painted like Harley Quinn's, and she jumps up to start mocking his concern immediately. 
I actually, I actually thought she would have been a really great Harley Quinn if yeah. she yeah. existed at this time. Yeah, I thought I thought this scene she was Harley Quinn meets Daphne from Scooby Doo. Yeah, <laughs> because she's got like this orange wig on that's yeah. got like a headband on it. Yep. Um, but yeah, I was thinking how great she would have been uh, in, in in any movie where she's supposed to play like a psychopath. Yeah. She says that she's killed the Milena that he didn't want, and now she's the perfect Milena. And he turns to walk out. She threatens suicide repeatedly as he leaves. She starts throwing bottles at him in the street from her balcony on his way to the car. We cut to Alex standing on the stairs down to the subway, watching her building the next morning as the Who's Who Are You kicks up again. And uh, once again, I'm expecting CSI to start, and it doesn't. Yeah. And this, the using the music Who Are You is like a little on the nose, I feel like, for <laughs> <Yes>. this moment. <laughs> uh, Milena exits her building in the morning and speaks with soldiers outside the building and then she rides off on a motorcycle with the guy from Alex's campus. So I don't know if this is more spy stuff or what exactly is happening Yeah, but he's here. totally creeping on her. Like he's like yes. in, I don't know, a cafe across the street or like a... He's, he's like in an alcove. Like yeah, a he's, stairs, like, he's like halfway stairs. down the stairs to oh, the subway. Oh, it's like to the subway. Yeah. yeah, but he's just sitting there watching her through the window. Kaitel asks Alex for the third or fourth time when he received the call from Elena and again, he says, I don't know. No, I, want I can't to be- remember the time with any precision. But I'm not asking you for the precise time. Eventually, Alex admits that the call must have come in between one and two, as it was naturally after one and obviously before two, because I think she was admitted to the hospital shortly after two. We see her in the apartment taking a handful of pills just before 10.30 p.m. There's a clock next to everybody for the rest of the movie yeah. so that we can timestamp all these moments. She takes the pills at 1030. So he's lying about it being after one o'clock that she took the pills because she he's she calls him literally right after she took the pills. He's playing back the answering machine message and listening to her final call in his apartment. He decides listening to the call that he should head to her place and he puts a jacket on. He tells Kaitel that he headed right over, but then we see him at a bar at 11 o'clock. So it's been at least a half hour since she took the pills. And a woman at the bar smiles at him. And when we cut back to him, there's just a spinning bar stool where he was standing <laughs> yeah. because he left so fast. <laughs> a little cartoony. He just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just hear like a whoop, whoop, whoop. A, little puff, a puff of smoke in an art Garfunkel yeah. shape. <laughs> a cigarette just falls out of the sky. In the present, he rides with the inspectors to her place, recreating the night of the incident. Kaitel asks if he had the radio on, and he says maybe, maybe it was a late station, which we determined earlier doesn't actually start until after midnight. Kaitel tells him that it was tuned to the second station, and he tells them that he turned it off for him the next day when the inspectors found the car. The radio was still on. Well, it's not the next day. Well, it that was, night yeah. when, when they found the car, because the radio was still on. Alex thanks him for saving his car battery. <laughs> We see in another flashback that Alex didn't get to her building until almost midnight. He's shot in this weird fisheye effect that I think is meant to imply that he's drunk here, but I don't know. We see Kaitel get an emergency call on his radio, and we flash back to the night in question. Alex finds her on the floor in the corner, but he tells Kaitel that he found her on the bed. Kaitel says that she could not have so quickly gotten from sober enough to call to the advanced coma that she arrived at the hospital in. Alex pretends not to understand that Kaitel is accusing him of fudging the timeline. Kaitel tells him that the second station ends at midnight, so he likely got to her place before then. Alex lectures her on the floor of the place. He's confident that she's just trying to scare him. He picks up her nearly unconscious body and lays it across the bed. Kaitel asks Alex if he'd like to confess. And this is where it starts to get extremely dark, because you know exactly what he's talking about. To what? The truth of the matter, Dr. Lennon, is, is that no one cares about Article 139B, suicide. It has little, if any, indictable application to this case. But Article 205, ravishment. There we have quite another apple, do we not? You know, I ordered a vaginal swab taken. Alex's breathing gets very sporadic. In another flashback, Alex puts on music and pulls her fully into the bed. We zoom into something on a shelf. I don't even know what this thing is. 
there's like a can on a shelf next to a mirror mm-hmm. and we get this long insert of it like i'm supposed to care what it is but i couldn't I even tell you what it was. don't even remember that shot <laughs> we suddenly see vodnik moving through a building lobby alex leaves her brother's photos on the kitchen table of the apartment and we see quick inserts of him naked again and sweaty and writhing and then fully clothed again so i'm like wait did he fantasize about raping her like earlier when he fantasized about choking her but now he's dressed again but now he's caressing her unconscious body on the bed and he starts to cut off her clothes with a knife Kaitel begins shouting at alex but he denies the charges of ravishment and we see him having sex with her unconscious body that night so that's the end of the this is it's a hundred percent official he raped this woman Mm -hmm. while she was unconscious this night he sets her back up in the sheets and verifies that she isn't faking it by holding a lighter to her feet before he calls an ambulance but it's like did the actress really just sit there while they held a lighter to her feet without moving her feet i feel like that would be extremely difficult well, he, it could have been a forced perspective maybe yeah maybe it just looks like it's bending around the curves of her foot i was just like jesus christ that seems awful to put an actress through he uh should we point out too he also took the time to redress her and right proper up properly yeah. in the bed back in the apartment Kaitel tells alex that he needs a confession because the swab won't be conclusive it, it won't id him all it will prove is that she was raped that night well, why would you tell him that i don't know <laughs> yeah uh, suddenly Vodnik enters the room and Kaitel tells him that he got an emergency call. So it, as soon as Vodnik walks in, Kaitel's starting to panic and he's like, oh shit, I should scare him into thinking that she's dead. Mm-hmm. So he says, oh, you know, before we came in, I got an emergency call on the radio. And then he's like, hey, Vodnik, is she okay? And he's like, yep, she's fine. And then he's <laughs> like, good, then I don't need to tell you anything. And he just, uh, Kaitel's like, yep, you're right. Absolutely right. And he gets up and leaves. And that's the end of the investigation. Which is a weird thing that the investigation happened at all at this point, because yeah. I'm pretty sure, so she's she was in surgery, and, like, I don't think he had any clues up until that point to, like, you know, be like, hey, we have to super urgently investigate this because does he do this for every od i don't know but that's what i'm saying i'm like she wasn't dead yet so there's there's no potential murder yet yeah um she didn't make any sort of complaints like what what prompted this investigation in the first place Uh, maybe he just had a feeling and he was following it I guess. But either Do you way, just have detectives on call at the hospital to yeah. take statements and on like ODs? Three and three of these guys working 24 hours to figure I, this out. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird that this happened at all. Kaitel leaves, and Vodnik asks what Alex got from Milena, and he supposes not enough. Vodnik tells Alex that one must love such a difficult woman tremendously, more than one's own dignity. Alex looks up and sees Vodnik standing in the room, and then... The room as it looked at the night that she died, and then the room as it looked when she tidied it up. We see Kaitel at home after a long day's work taking his suit off, and then we cut to a few weeks later in New York as Alex passes Milena as she's getting out of a taxi and he's getting into it, and they lock eyes and he notices her tracheotomy scar. He calls out to her as the taxi pulls away like he deserves to waste one more second of her life, yeah. and she walks away ignoring him as she should. We see a POV looking over the river from the bridge, and I can only hope this is Alex's POV contemplating suicide for what he's done, but I doubt he has the decency to do that. And that's the end of the film. Yeah. I. What was this movie about? It was about a guy taking advantage of a flaky girlfriend uh, when she OD'd because she was depressed about him. It then why all this espionage stuff yeah the spy stuff is unnecessary why all this weird like hints at this network of other guys i mean i guess it's just for his petty jealousy stuff yeah but i it could have just been ex-boyfriends it didn't need to be like an international spy ring yeah (laughs) it didn't need to feel like a james bond movie but i was desperate to find something like that yeah i was spending too much of my time focusing on that like who are these guys? Who's this guy watching them on the bus? Like, I was like... It's like, okay, they're coming out of Bratislava. Where are they going? Yeah. What is the other side of this bridge? I, I can't looking, find any labels. I was effing looking up borders. I was like, they're in Yugoslavia. They're crossing into <laughs> Austria. <laughs> Who, what, what, where, where were these countries during the block what, in 1980? What was happening? <laughs> I, I was investigating what was happening yeah. in Europe in 1980. And none of it mattered. None yeah, of it mattered. It was... 
there was there was a lot of things that I do appreciate about this film. Sure, I got a really. I, I think this movie will be also very different if you watch it a second time. I only yeah. watched it once for, uh, before we recorded, so I feel like knowing all that you know at the end, it's a very different second watch. Yes, um, and so maybe the. Because I found the cutting kind of confusing for most of the movie. Yeah. I mean, um, it's kind of supposed to be. It, I think no, that's why is. Chris Nolan likes it so much is because he's like, oh, God, this will confuse people when I show it to them. I love that. <laughs> it is confusing, but it's it's a frustrating kind of confusing because I felt like I think at least with um, Chris Nolan's movies, when he when he when he cuts to sort of confuse you or mislead you and then reveals more over time, it's to reveal something larger it's 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 to unravel a mystery yeah and here it seems to have been done for no real purpose except to make things more interesting than they actually are yeah Mm because if you put all these shots in order it's a much less interesting movie right and you would realize how much unnecessary footage is in this movie and unnecessary scenes are in this movie it's just like it would be very boring if this was cut in order and why does she want so desperately to be with this guy that's what was frustrating to me it's like this guy you can't explain what people are attracted to or what what well, relationship they want to be in. And I and I feel like she she obviously has had psychological trauma in her life and and so you're you're it's you're drawn to people who potentially are abusive to you. Like that th- th- Did either of you get an incesty vibe when she talks about her dad because her entire family was dead except for her and that she's dating this guy that's 30 years older than her? Mm. I well I I felt like she had father issues yeah. by by you know saying that she wasn't um you know once once her mom and brother were dead that they weren't much of a family anymore right. and then she's with this older man that she keeps going back to I did feel like she had father problems but I didn't get any incest vibes Our director here was Nicholas Rogue he worked his way up starting as an editor and eventually working second unit photography for Lawrence of Arabia and the 67 Casino Royale, as well as uncredited cinematography on Dr. Zhivago. He went on to lens Corman's The Mask of Red Death, Truffaut's Fahrenheit 451, and Schlesinger's Far From the Matting Crowd. Probably my favorite film of his is 1973's Don't Look Now, which I'm sure we'll do a Patreon review for eventually. It's a really fun one. Uh, he also directed the original adaptation of Roald Dahl's The Witches in 1990. Ooh. He's used to directing rock stars after having directed Performance, starring Mick Jagger, and The Man Who Fell to Earth, starring David Bowie. I, I think we can also definitively say, uh, in 1980, Art Garfunkel was the actor of Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> he's a convincing character in this movie. But but I also feel like it was a situation of, like, I picture Bender as like, oh yeah, Paul, I'm going to make a movie too. I'm going to have hookers and, and sex scenes yeah. and I'm going to show everyone that what a cool sex symbol yeah. I am. Well, there was sex in the other movie. Not as many hookers though. Yeah. Writer Yale Udoff, this was his first of two feature screenplays before Eve of Destruction in 91. He wrote A Man from Uncle episode, A Tales from the Crypt episode, uh, Strung Along, which is a killer puppet episode, and not much else. Uh, DP Anthony B. Richmond, he was the DP for a lot of rogue titles. Also Candyman, Tales from the Hood, Legally Blonde, Dumb and Dumberer, Dirty Dancing 2, Havana Nights, and John Tucker Must Die. Art Garfunkel was Alex Linden. Not unlike what happens in the film, Art Garfunkel's real-life girlfriend, Lori Bird, committed suicide during the film's production by a volume overdose. What? Which I have to imagine affected his performance. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, the performances in this movie were fabulous. Yes, everybody does. A great everybody job. was. Yeah. I have no complaints about the acting in this movie. Uh, obviously, he's half of Simon and Garfunkel, so he has a lot of soundtrack credits. We saw him as Nate Lee in our Patreon review of Catch Twenty Two. He also appears in Carnal Knowledge, Boxing Helena, and Fifty Four. Teresa Russell was Malena Flaherty. She's Sophie McDonald, Bill Murray's love interest in Razor's Edge. She's Sandra Van Ryan in Wild Things, and she's Emma Marco, the wife of Sandman in Spider-Man 3. She also stars in rogue films Eureka, Track 29, Cold Heaven, Hotel Paradise, Insignificance, and Aria. Harvey Keitel was Inspector Neticel. He's Mr. White in Reservoir Dogs. He's LT, the lieutenant in Bad Lieutenant. He's the wolf in Pulp Fiction. He's also Speed in Mother Jugs and Speed, 
and we had him earlier this year in Saturn 3, but this is the first time we're hearing his voice because last time he was fully dubbed by Roy Dotrice. <laughs> he was also just Angelo Bruno in Scorsese's The Irishman last year. Or was that this year? I don't know. Seems like forever ago. It was ago. at least last, it was last year. year. Denim Elliott was Stefan Vodnik. Uh, he's Sidney Bainan in The Boys from Brazil, which is a great movie. He's Marcus Brody in Raiders of the Lost Ark next year, and he's back for Last Crusade. He has a fun Easter egg cameo in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull that I love reminding Richard about. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, <laughs> he plays Colonel Grayson in Return from the River Kwai uh, from Folk's director Andrew V. McClaglin, which we mentioned in a previous episode is not a sequel to The Bridge of River Kwai. <laughs> Just sounds like it is. William Hootkins played Colonel Taylor. He's back as Munson later this year in Flash Gordon. He returns as Dawn in Sphinx next year. He plays Major Eaton in Raiders. He's Harry Howler in Superman 4. And he's the Falcor voice from NeverEnding Story 3. We had the <laughs> voice from the first film, Alan Oppenheimer, as a rabbi in Private Benjamin a few movies back. And mm. now we've had a second Falcor. But not the second Falcor. The... Well, maybe the second. I, is there? Oh, I, I well, now we have to look at who was the Never Ending Story two. I don't know if Falcor, Falcor was in part two, was it? Oh, I don't know. I, don't oh, I never saw anything past the first one. But if if there was uh, Falcor in it, I would assume they brought Alan Oppenheimer back for it. Part two is so weird. Aren't aren't all three of them weird? <laughs> yeah, but part two is even is just weird as a continuation of the first one, where the third one is like just a mess do you think they're gonna reboot that franchise i don't see why they wouldn't or, or not reboot but sequelize oh uh no i'm i, I i'm a i was thinking would remake would, yeah okay. i was thinking remake so uncredited in the second film as felcor is donald arthur donald arthur okay so we haven't had him yet Let's does see. he have any 1980 <laughs> i'm credits? checking <laughs> i just clicked on that 1980 he is only in a what appears to be German television movie okay. called Ein Guru Comet. Oh, God, I love <laughs> that one. Night of the Comet? <laughs> yep. Eugene Lipinski played the hospital policeman. He's a news vendor in Superman 2. He's Kane in Outland. He's Kirk in Shock Treatment. He's a cosmonaut in Superman 4. And he's also a G-Man in The Last Crusade. George Robichek was policeman number one. He plays an astronaut in You Only Live Twice. I don't remember any astronauts in that movie. In You Only Live Twice? I remember them in Moonraker. I don't remember them in You Only uh, Live Twice. You Only Live Twice is all about a uh, space program. Is it? Yeah. Uh, they're capturing space capsules. The the I Russians it was in, in Amer- Japan. It is, but that's where the base is. Blo- Blofeld is launching up larger capsules to capture american from his volcano base yeah he's capturing american and russian to make it seem like the other ones are sabotaging their space program oh uh, okay to i co- guess it's to a, cause a war it's a crater base it's crater. not a volcano yeah crater like, base yeah it's a lake and it's, a, a, it's crater. a fake fake lake fake lake he's also private gardener in the dirty dozen he's stromberg one captain in the spy who loved me and he plays commander prodigy in star wars episode four who's prodigy which one was the title Co- again? Commander Praji in uh, A New Hope. P R A J I. Ah. Oh, yeah. Where are you taking this thing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know I, if I character you would have was at quote. least some lines from him. <laughs> I literally, like, I try to wiki these things and Google them when it's like a a big franchise like Star Wars and get some backstory and I could not put it together for this guy but there's entire books written about his life like where his <laughs> daughter grew up on what planet and where she went to school and it's like what the hell <laughs> it's ridiculous how how much of a backstory every face has in the whole in the whole franchise but yeah I I think it's an okay movie I think they overdid it with the editing yeah. To try and uh, make it stylistic. Well, yeah, because like I said before, it's not in service of the story. Yeah. And I don't think it's revealing anything in a, f- in a fun new order. Mm-hmm. It just makes the story slightly harder to follow. Yeah. And it's not it's not making a statement on anything. Yeah. Other than, like you said, the juxtaposition of her in bed and yeah. in, in surgery. What, yeah. Yeah, that is that is startling in a way that i think was definitely intentional um but that could have been a scene once they got to the end 
Right. The fact that they redid it several times was, you know, it's it sort of lost its lost its effect. I'm like, okay, yeah. I've seen this. I don't really want to keep watching that. Right. You're it's desensitized disturbing enough. by the end. Um, you know, but this, I think that the best part of this film was the cinematography yep. and the acting. Yep. And it ma- which makes sense because we got really good people to be in the film and we and we had a director who was a cinematographer yeah. direct the film. But it and I think that that happens like I feel like that happened in Windows as well where we had a cinematographer directing and it, and it looks great, but the story was lacking. Right. Up or down on this one, Jess? I'm I'm going to give it a down just because I don't think I would recommend this to anyone. I I wouldn't be super eager to watch it again. And and considering how much, uh, how, how hardcore some of the sex scenes are that are left in. Yeah, there's uh, very few people that I would. There's very few consider. people I would say yes, yeah. definitely watch this movie. Um, it would be they, it would definitely I would only recommend it to you know a, a a real cinephile. Yeah, it's it's a down for me also. Um, I don't think there's anything here that you absolutely have to check it out for. Uh, down for me as well. I, I, th- I did not care for this movie at all in any way. Yeah. Um, where's this going on your letterbox, Richard? I have a really low. Um, I have it at one Oh nine. Okay. Uh, this is just below. Just tell me what you want. And right above effects. Okay. Jess. I have this one at 65. It is just below somewhere in time and just above Gloria. Okay. Um, I actually have it at 57th place. It's just below Midnight Madness and just above Those Lips, Those Eyes. So quite a range for us. Yeah. But I'm actually surprised with how high you had it at 109. I mean, I guess <laughs> because it's competently made. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just, I can't imagine a scenario where I would ever want to watch this movie no. again in any, almost no, yeah, almost no you, circumstances. S- similar to Caligula in that way where you're like, yeah, it is it is a well-made movie, but I'm yep. good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I'm going to watch that one again. <laughs> I think that's about everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we're Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing The Awakening, which IMDb describes like so. An archaeologist discovers his daughter is possessed by the spirit of an Egyptian queen. To save mankind, he must destroy her. We leave you now with the trailer for The Awakening. I'm getting a lot of faces because that (laughs) is inaccurate. (laughs) That is very inaccurate. (laughs) The Awakening, ladies and gentlemen. Through the ages... The ancient monuments of Egypt have been hunting grounds for archaeologists, tourists, and grave robbers. One by one, the sacred tombs of pharaohs and queens have been violated, yielding their priceless treasures and occult mysteries. But the evil one, Kara, has slept undisturbed for thousands of years, waiting, waiting for the awakening. She must have killed thousands. Kara. You must be forever alone. Do not approach Kara, lest your soul be withered. The inscription was a warning for mankind. For all those who take part in her awakening are doomed. Charlton Heston, obsessed by the awakening, intrudes where no man should go. I'm frightened. Susanna York disobeys the ancient warning that threatens to destroy her. You're going to try the ritual, aren't you? Stephanie Zimbalis defies the deadly legend and brings forth the terror. The evil one must be forever alone. She must not live again. For 4,000 years, she has been silent and dead and waiting for the awakening. They thought they had buried her forever.